Good morning, and thank you for logging into Wave Energy Scotland's first innovation call for power takeoff systems. I'm Ian Forsyth, and with me today is Tim Hunt, who's the interim director of Wave Energy Scotland, and Andrew Lever, who's the director of innovation in Scotland for the Carbon Trust. Um, Ways, which is well. well Wave Energy Scotland, which is more commonly known as WES, uh, is a newly set up body. And over the next 45 minutes, we'll be hearing from Tim and Andrew about this first call that's gone out. We'll also be hearing from Rona Campbell, who's the Senior Development Manager at WES, about some of the more technical details of the call. Um, we also want your questions though. You'll see in the window on the right hand side of this video, uh, a discussion box. All you have to do to send your questions through to us type them in, hit enter, and they'll come through to us here. Now we do have a programme to go through in terms of some specific information that we want to get out to you over the next 45 minutes. So we will be holding your questions off until after we finish that, which will be about the first 25 to 30 minutes of the webcast. But please be assured we will try and get through as many of your questions as we possibly can. If we don't manage to get through all of them, we would ask that you then submit your questions through PCS and the team at WES will make sure that they're answered there. Um, but we'll talk more about PCS at the end just in terms of the next stages and what to do if you decide to take your interest a little bit further. Um, there's a lot to cover, but just first of all, um, we'll be hearing from Rona about Wave Energy Scotland. Um, it's a Scottish government initiative which I are involved in, in running, I believe. What's the government's thinking behind WES? Well, Wave Energy Scotland is a, is a new organisation um, set up and by Highlands Islands Enterprise, funded by the Scottish Government, um, to take a, a new uh, view of how to develop wave energy technology. Um, it's very early stages at the moment uh, with developing processes and procedures, but I guess there's key, three key things that we're doing at the moment. Uh, firstly, we're doing, running a, a knowledge capture project, which is working with the existing Scottish wave technology companies to try and capture some of the knowledge that's been developed over the last 15 years uh, and trying to avoid us from making the same mistakes that perhaps have been made in the past, but also to develop the best ideas uh, and take those forward into our work programme. We're also establishing uh, an industry advisory group, uh, which we will intend to populate with uh, industry members, utilities, investors, uh, to try and give WES some strategic direction and give us a bit of commercial focus to ensure that we're heading in the right direction, if you like. Mm -hmm. And then finally, uh, and probably most importantly for today's uh, webinar, is we're trying to develop our work program, uh, which will consist of a, a number of innovation calls, probably five over the next year, uh, of which the PTO call is the first call. Okay. Andrew, you're in charge of innovation in Scotland for the Carbon Trust. What's the Carbon Trust's involvement in this programme? So, yeah, thanks Ian. The, the Carbon Trust has a, a kind of long history and experience of helping to design and implement innovation programmes for you know, early stage technologies um, on a number of different areas, offshore wind and bioenergy, for example. Um, what the Carbon Trust has also done over the last decade is put quite a lot of effort and thought into the marine sector. Um, you know, both in the UK and, and beyond. Um, and so really what we are providing and, and bringing together is, is bringing those two elements together. Our experience in the marine sector, our um, experience of designing um, and implementing technology innovation programmes mm -hmm. um, to help, you know, Tim and Wave Energy Scotland design the best programme for the sector um, for, to go forward. Okay, so that's, that's your involvement. Tim, you said a wee bit about ways there, but your specific role within the organisation, can you maybe tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, well, uh, as I say, I'm the inter interim direct director of WES, uh, and my responsibility at the moment is to, to set up the processes and procedures and develop the work programme that I discussed earlier. So at the moment, we're just about to embark on recruiting some staff. We're developing our ideas. We've got a draft programme, mm -hmm. uh, a work programme. Uh, like I say, the PTO call is the first part of that. Um, and we're keen to capture this information from uh, existing developers keen to get an advisory group in place to give us that future guidance as we develop the programme going forward. And so those are the, 
those are the key things that are really happening now at the moment. Right, quite a long to-do list then. Yeah. It's, it's plenty to do, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's time I think now to go over to the first of the segments from Rona, where she'll be talking a little bit about the background and the philosophy to WES and just developing that a little bit further. Let's hear from Rona now. Wave Energy Scotland is the new technology research and development body for wave energy in Scotland. WES is funded by the Scottish Government and is part of Highlands and Islands Enterprise. It has one major objective, to use public sector money to develop wave energy technology to the point where the private sector is ready to reinvest. Wave Energy Scotland is different from previous funding programmes in four areas. Firstly, WES has a long-term commitment to the sector. We believe that it could take up to 10 years to achieve our main objective. WES is fully funded by the Scottish Government and has a budget of £14.3 million until the end of the financial year in 2016. Secondly, WES is able to fund wave energy technology research and development projects up to 100% via a contract for R&D services known as pre-commercial procurement. Pre-commercial procurement enables public sector bodies to marry up innovative ideas and technology businesses. The aim is to provide innovative solutions to specific public sector challenges and needs. It also sits outside state aid regulations due to its pre-commercial nature and is more prescriptive in nature than grant funding. So take a look at the PTO call guidance document for more details. Pre-commercial procurement is also more collaborative in nature than grant funding which brings me on to the third difference. WES seeks to help the sector to deliver the best possible solution to common challenges, rather than funding multiple organisations to address the same challenge. This slide explains what we mean. We believe that innovative companies in the sector should focus on developing their core intellectual property, the primary converter, whilst working together to optimise components and subsystems such as the PTO, foundations, moorings, control systems and novel materials. This is why we have decided to launch the PTO call first because it is the most important subsystem economically for a wave energy machine. This also means there is a requirement for subsystems developed via contracts with WES to be shared with other companies in the sector on reasonable commercial terms. Lastly, WES will look to minimise the technical risks in its projects. It's not about going straight to expensive and risky full-scale prototype building and testing. We will ask developers to go through a four-stage development process. In return, WES is able to commit to funding technologies that have a good chance of reaching commercial success right through all the stages. OK, thanks, Rona. Um, the call guidance document states that WES, WES budgets are subject to Scottish Government spending reviews. Um, how can that be a long-term commitment if it's subject to reviews? Well, we, we have to be careful about uh, separating the, um, the funding cycle and commitment here. The Scottish Government have made a clear commitment that they will support WES going uh, into the future. Uh, and the, the Energy Minister himself, Fergus Hewing, has, has made that commitment that he will support us um, in the long term. The spending review is just a confirmation of, of, of the commitment made by the, the Scottish Government. So uh, the commitment is there and that will be seen as, as the budgets are decided over the next couple of years. But there is a commitment, a financial commitment for next financial year and a long-term commitment from the Government to support ways. And I think um, if, it, if there's any doubt about the commitment from the Scottish Government, you just have to look at the, the, the track record that the Scottish Government has uh, going back over 10 years, initially funding um, the European Marine Energy Centre, developing that, uh, and then running a number of programmes, the Weights Programme, the Waters Programme, and more recently the MRCF, uh, Marine Renewables Commercialisation Fund, uh, and also um, commitment through the Renewables Infrastructure Fund, REEF, uh, for developing projects. So there's been a long-term commitment from the Scottish Government and there is no reason to believe that that will, that will change. The commitment is there uh, and WES will go forward with a funding, uh, appropriate funding programme to support all the calls that we are initiating now. So you're confident the spending reviews Very won't confident. get in the way of... Absolutely. Is that a view held by yourself as well then, Andrew? Do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I, think, I think Tim's covered um, completely very well. I think the, 
I think the Scottish government's commitment is um, is, is quite clear, um, and I think that's that's the main message to, you know, to to give to to give to people today. Okay. Another thing that people might be slightly concerned about is in terms of technology certification, which is expensive, uh, and I believe is a requirement of ways. Is, is that correct? Is it a requirement, the technology certification? The, the certification aspects come in at uh, the latter stages of the um, uh, of the development programme, stages three and four, which is detailed in the, the call guidance document. Uh, and I think it reflects, um, uh, as maybe heard, with Rona covering off a, a slightly different approach to technology development. Uh, and Wes is very keen to, to have a more kind of robust engineering design um, approach and even a standardisation um, of certain you know components to, to help develop the um, the, the technology uh, in, a, in a more appropriate manner now. Um, so uh, people will see there's that's a requirement in the, th the third and fourth stages of the development process, um, and we feel that that's an appropriate step to um, to support people. Um, it shouldn't be seen as a hindrance, but to support people in making sure that they are developing at that stage a, a robust engineering solution. Um, when we're getting to stages which are, you know, prototyping, so we're you know putting significant investment into them. Um, okay. So that's why that, that that certification requirement is there. So only comes into play for stages three and four. Yeah. yeah, we don't need to concern ourselves at stages one and two, which we'll obviously be hearing a little bit more of later sure. on. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think it's also important to say that um, having certification it, it gives external uh, investors um, and industry players uh, a better view of, of the, the, the maturity of a technology because it's a, a, a standard if you like it adds credibility to the whole program mm -hmm. um, which we perhaps haven't had in the past right so without so that certification it may yeah. not be taken quite seriously is that well it's, it's a known it's a known point isn't it every it, every t it, all of the technologies will, will when, once they reach the certification process can all be deemed to be have a reached that the same point so they can be compared okay so I think it's an, it's an important from, from, from taking an ex external view uh, of where the technologies are within the program, having a certification process in, in place alongside the technology development. Okay, that's fine. I think probably time now to move on to the second of Rona's segments, where she's going to talk a little bit more in more, a little bit more detail, specifically about the PTO call, which is the first of a number of calls I think planned by Wes over the coming years. So let's hear more from Rona now. Wave Energy Scotland's first call is for power takeoff systems. Wes will also launch three further subsystem calls and a novel device call over the next few months. The PTO call was launched on the 19th of March 2015 and the deadline for applications is the 22nd of May 2015. The call is being handled by Public Contract Scotland. It is also known as PCS. You'll be able to download the relevant documents from the PCS website, but you must be registered on PCS in order to take part in the call. Applicants can also use PCS to ask questions anonymously, and answers will be published on the site to all registered parties. Application documents and supporting materials should be uploaded onto the PCS site when complete. The main documents are, Firstly, the call guidance document, which explains the call and provides instructions for completing the application forms. Secondly, the application forms. Please note there are two separate forms. One form for stages one and two, and a second form for stages three and four. And thirdly, there is a questionnaire. The key task of the PTO is to transform the motion from the prime mover, as it reacts with itself or a fixed reaction point and convert it into a smooth electrical output. A functional specification of a PTO can be found on page 14 of the call guidance document. Wesley's PTO competition will award technology development contracts for projects that will provide a step change in the capital cost and or performance over current technology. The project also needs to deliver a reliable PTO via high quality engineering and technology risk management and deliver a PTO that on commercialisation will help the wave energy sector reach a levelised cost of energy of no more than £150 per megawatt hour. To ensure high quality engineering and to minimise technical risks, the PTO call has been divided into four programme stages. Applicants must decide which stage to apply for. The correct selection of the appropriate programme stage will improve each applicant's chance of being awarded a contract 
and applicants should carefully consider the stage entry criteria for each stage on pages 43 to 45 of the call guidance document. In addition to the stage entry criteria, applications will also be assessed on their technical merit, commercial merit and the total cost of the project for WES. OK, thanks again, Rona. Um, we know from what Rona said and from reading the documentation that there will be a financial test for the PTO call. Is that potentially something that could penalise smaller companies? It certainly isn't our intention to penalise small companies and discourage them from applying. I mean, we're, we're, we're interested in innovative solutions here, wherever that comes from, whichever stage of technology or whichever size of company uh, that comes from. So that certainly isn't the, uh, the intention. Um, the PTO, PTO questionnaire details um, the financial requirements of the, of, the, of the call, and it does allow different allow uh, amounts of information for different companies, so large, small and medium, uh, to address that particular issue. Um, so you know, we're not going to ask uh, for you know, extensive financial information for a small company, that's not the case. So the level of information that we're asking for is appropriate to the size of the company and also the, the stage, the programme stage that they are applying for. Okay. So. Yeah. Is Wes, can you, can you provide some guidance on which programme stage it's most appropriate for in relation to potential applicants? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I, think, um, I think this is a really uh, important point for people yeah. to, um, to, to pick up on. Um, the, the, the call guidance document has some kind of very clear, um, if you like, entry requirements for a particular development um, stage and, and activity. Um, and and that, that's, that's because um, you know, we're very keen that we don't move too quickly through this process and that people are able to bring their projects um, uh, and their ideas uh, and be suitably funded at the, at the appropriate stage of those ideas. Mm -hmm. so, so really, um, what, what I'd encourage people to do is you know, have a look at that document. If they feel that they can cover sufficiently the, the, the entry criteria for a particular stage, then that is fine. Um, but if they feel that, that that is not the case, then actually it was probably more appropriate for them to maybe come back a stage and, and complete some of that work as part of an earlier, uh, an earlier project. Um, and that still allows them to continue through the process um, to, to, to latter stages. Okay. So it, it, it is, it's important that people um, you know, do feel confident about that they, that they have completed certain activities before they enter a stage. Um, and you know, that's, that's something for, you know, that, that, that uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's an important point for people to, to consider. Mm. So if they have reviewed the stages and they're still a little bit unclear, um, is that something that they should ask about through PCS or is there another course, route for yeah. them to find out? I think PCS would PCS be there if the specific yeah. questions on that to, okay. to, to push them through that process. So yeah. anyone that looks at the four stages and is a little unsure, then PCS is the route for it? Okay, that's, that's yeah. great. So we've, we've already alluded to the fact that there are four stages uh, in the process. In this next film from Rona, we're going to look at the first two stages in a little bit more detail and see just exactly what's involved in stages one and two. So let's hear from Rona again. We're going to look at the programme stages now. Each of the programme stages is designed using a logical framework as shown on the screen now. Firstly, applicants are asked to articulate the impact their project will have on the long-term levelised cost of energy for the WAVE sector. By long-term, we mean more than five years. For Stage 1 applications, an overall narrative on the topic will be sufficient. But for programme stages 2 to 4, detailed LCOE modelling will be required. Applicants will be asked to develop a series of target outcomes for their project. The full set of target outcomes metrics for consideration are described in section 10 of the call guidance. At the earlier programme stages, namely 1 and 2, WES expects applicants to focus on the efficiency, reliability and survivability of their technology. For later programme stages, namely 3 and 4, applicants will be asked to consider the full set of target outcomes metrics in relation to their technology, and how these influence the impact in the LCOE. Applicants will be asked to deliver some mandatory outputs as part of their projects 
and should take account of them in their applications. Applicants are asked to provide a detailed activity plan designed to deliver the outputs and demonstrate the target outcomes for their project. Applicants must complete a detailed activity-based budget with appropriate tasks, deliverables and milestones. We'll now give an overview on the objectives of programme stages one and two and then take questions on both. The objective of programme stage one is to support investigations into the feasibility of sound and innovative PTO technologies that are applicable to the wave energy sector. In particular, WES is also interested in awarding contracts for the feasibility of transferring energy conversion technologies from other sectors into the wave energy sector. The objective of programme stage two is to optimise the technology through modelling, analytical development, physical and laboratory testing of critical components and or the testing of a complete energy conversion system at scale, namely 1 20th or similar. Proposed physical models should have the necessary functionality to enable bench scale test to fully validate or confirm piece part assembly, manufacturability, performance, cost effectiveness and basic operating principles of the device. Scale should be judiciously chosen so the model produces the physical, functional and performance characteristics of the proposed device. Scale models will validate form, fit and function, demonstrate that basic technological components can be effectively integrated, validate design assumptions or predictions, identify and correct unforeseen design and performance issues at an early stage, and reduce the risk of follow-on efforts, including the same issues at higher programme stages. OK, there were references in there from Rona about applicants developing target outcomes. Um, can you tell us a bit more in detail just exactly what that involves? Yeah, sure. I mean, one of Wes's kind of core objectives, of course, is to deliver technology um, that can achieve a, you know, a competitive levelised cost of energy. Um, uh, and really what those target outcomes do is that they, um, they, they contribute and influence that levelised cost of energy. So uh, I think in Appendix 10 of the call guidance document, um, there's, there's a, lot, a lot of detail in terms of explaining those, those target outcomes. Um, but at the highest level, there's, there's four um, there's the performance of the machine, um, it's, its availability, um, its affordability and its survivability. Um, so really what we're looking for um, is for people to, to consider those, those, those kind of performance metrics um, so that when they come to their particular project and the, the stage at which the project is at, um, is that they're really able to test and, and, and to demonstrate that their particular technology is, is meeting those kind of um, those core metrics, or what you would call target outcomes. Um, okay. So, so, so in a sense, you know, people will be looking for, um, you know, getting sufficient confidence that at the end of their project they can prove that their their technology is reliable, or it's cost effective, or it's survivable, etc. Uh, and so, those target outcomes are really there to to provide the evidence base uh, and the, the the outputs that we're looking for that give us the confidence that that LCOE target can can, can be achieved ultimately. Okay. What would your advice be in terms of the kind of level of detail that needs to be in these target outcomes? Do they need to be really specific or can they be a little more open-ended? So, so the, 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 the target outcomes, as you would expect, as you're moving into the latter stages of the development program, um, will become more, um, will become broader and we'll be looking for more evidence and detail on those. So at the very initial feasibility kind of stage where people have ideas, we're looking for you know, levels of confidence and direction that, that, that those target outcomes can be achieved. When we get into the latter stages of, kind of prototyping and physical testing, we're looking for more quantitative, quantitative measures that you know, the, the system can be reliable or it, it, it performs to a certain efficiency. So the, 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 if you like, the, the KPIs and the outcomes ratchet up uh, as, right. as you go through the process. Right. I need more detail. I need more detail. detail. Okay. Yeah. There's been reference, and in your answer as well to this, the, the levelised cost of, of energy, uh, and that's been got a target of £150 per megawatt hour. How is, has that been calculated? Well, at the, at the end of the day, wave, wave energy has to be cost competitive with other energies, and we have taken, for the UK market, the um, 
the cost of offshore wind as being the, the reference point for that. So un unless we can see a pathway with the technology to a cost of energy around £150 per megawatt hour, then it's not going to be cost competitive. It's not going to be a commercial product in the, in the long term. Um, what we're not expecting is for them to achieve £150 per megawatt hour now, and that's by no means the, the objective. Uh, what we need to see is, is a pathway to that, and that, that figure will be achieved within a commercial project at uh, sort of gigawatt scale deployments in the future. So we're not looking for that now, we're looking for uh, a pathway to that, some sort of methodology that shows that cost reduction methodology can bring us to that figure in the future. So it's about demonstrating the potential, essentially? And absolutely, yes. Right. De de demonstrating that we can get there in the, in the long term. Okay. W what sort of evidence would you be looking for in terms of someone being able to demonstrate that potential? Well, it, it's the sort of evidence that um, we, 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 can, we, can, we can work out the costs at, at the, the scale that we're developing the technology now, and we can use uh, le learning effects figures, we can look, look at the, 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 fact, the, the inf uh, effects of scaling up, we can apply some standard methodology to the current figures to see whether they're likely to reach uh, the 150 megawatt hour target in the future. Okay. So yeah. it's, it's about applying that methodology to the figures that you have for the technology now. Right, okay, and see where we go with it. Yeah. Okay, um, we're just about to go over to the last of Rona's segments where we'll look at stages three and four. Before we do that, however, just to remind you, um, if you do have questions for Andrew and Tim, please get them in now because we'll be going over to audience questions once we've completed this next segment. But let's go over and hear from Rona about stages three and four in the process. Now we're going to look at programme stages three and four. The objective of programme stage three is to fabricate a scaled prototype, typically at around one-tenth of the scale, to establish and verify subsystem and system level functionality and preparation for testing in a simulated environment. Activities during this stage cover both initial dry scale testing and wet scale testing in a relevant environment. This represents a major step up in technology's demonstrated readiness and risk mitigation and is the stage leading to large-scale testing at Programme Stage 4. The objective of Programme Stage 4 is to design and fabricate a pre-commercial prototype from one-quarter scale up to full scale for testing in conjunction with a wave energy converter device. Activities during this stage cover both dry-scale testing and wet-scale testing in a relevant environment. This stage will be used to confirm the operational characteristics and performance of the PTO in conjunction with one or more wave energy converter devices. So, stages three and four, there's a requirement to license the technology to others. Why is that in place? Well, one of the key objectives of WES was to, to develop a more collaborative approach to technology development, uh, trying to get uh, more collaborative work, uh, collaborating on subsystems that are common and generic that can be used by more than one device. Um, so that the requirement to li license IP is based on that approach. It isn't, it isn't um, a requirement to give away the technology that you've developed by any means, it's, it's a requirement to license it, and that is at commercial rates. So, you know, you'll be paid for your technology effectively. So it's not, we're not, we're not giving it away, um, we're requiring you to license it. And that is all about trying to, to develop a, a more collaborative approach within the program. Okay. Um, does also a question, I think, there around what potential applicants need to budget in order to complete all the required outputs. Can you give us some advice on that in terms of budgets? Yeah, I, I mean, I think um, the, uh, in the very basic sense, um, you know, time and materials is, is, is the kind of the highest level what people need to think through, of course. And the, uh, the, the, the suggested activities in the in, in the call document, you know, do give people a, a feel for the kind of activities that we would be expecting them to undertake 
you know, at a, at a particular stage in time. Now, again, you know, the earlier stages will will, will perhaps be more, um, you know, resource intensive. It's about ideas. It's about modelling, etc. Um, clearly, when we get into the latter stages, where there's kind of physical um, physical testing, um, then of course the, the sums of money uh, and the resource required is going to be um, some, somewhat greater, mm -hmm. uh, and, th and that's reflected really in the 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 the. the, 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 the the budgets that are available um, in each of those stages. Um, so I think the advice would be to to to, to look um, at the activities that are that, that are re required to do under a particular project. Um, there is sufficient um, guidance in the, uh, in the in the application forms to to break down that cost into its, into its constituent parts. Okay. Um, and and people you know, take a view as well as the time, of course, it takes um, a particular project. Um, to, to step through those activities okay. um, to um, to complete the project um, at a budget. So all the detail that's needed is in the documentation yeah. in relation yes. to budget things, so people needn't be, be, be concerned about that in terms of struggling with it. Okay. Um, we've had a question, said we'd go over to audience questions. We've got okay. a few coming in just now. Uh, the first one that came through was from Connor, and his question is, what is considered full scale for a PTO in the context of this call? I think that very much depends on the technology that we're talking about. D the different technologies will have a, a, a different natural scale for uh, PTOs. Um, our thoughts are, you know, around about the 100 kilowatt mark is is probably about the right scale to demonstrate the technology in this case. But it, it is very much dependent on the technology. Uh, we're not going to prescribe and, and, and insist that you, you you test at a particular scale. Um, I think that would make things overly complicated and, and, it, and it wouldn't fit with the different technologies. So it's whatever is appropriate for the, t for the technology, but obviously has to be within the budget for that particular program stage. Okay. Mm -hmm. No, I think that's, I think that's, uh, that's probably the right approach. I mean, the uh, different devices, of course, are different sizes and different applications. And mm -hmm. um, I think we are relatively open about that at this stage in the, mm -hmm. the program's kind of inception in, in life. Yeah, um, and I would fully expect that as we get further into this over the next you know, years, that maybe some of that standardised kind of in, you know, uh, thinking and approach will come together uh, and maybe that will help define you know, a particular kind of sweet spot in terms of a, a particular size. Yeah. Okay. That answers Connor's question. If not, Connor, come back with a supplementary. We'll see if we can squeeze it in. Um, the next question is from David, and he's asked how the £150 per megawatt hour LCOE cost applied to the PTO energy output. Uh, so how is it applied if we don't know the costs of the WEC? No. Yeah. So uh, this is... Uh uh, yes, of course, the PTO is, is one element um, of the of, of the device. Um, you know, and we have the, the, the call guidance document does you know break down you know at a reasonably still but an illustrative level around how the capital cost of a of a complete WIC system is built up. Um, so there is an indication there of the kind of likely PTO's you know contribution to that capital, how much it's going to cost. Um, and so I guess there's one consideration there. The second one will, of course, be around the PTO itself in terms of its efficiency and its performance and output, uh, reliability and availability. Um, uh, so really, we're, I guess we're looking for a combination of those things that, and confidence that, that a particular design and approach can fit in with, with, with that broader kind of um, uh, yeah, target for, for, the, for the complete system. So th there's a bit of, yeah, there's a bit of in uh, uh, interpretation there, of course, but I think that's... That's what I would suggest in terms of uh, how, how to dissect that. Okay. Anything you want to add to that, Tom? No, I, I would agree. Uh, I think the, you know, the, P, the performance of the PTO is, is key to the overall uh, cost of energy. Um, obviously, the, the, the capital cost uh, for the work itself, but fundamentally, um, you know, efficiency has a very big influence on the, on the cost of energy over a 20-year period. Okay. Uh, when it's installed in a, in a wave farm, for instance. So there, there's, a, there's a key link between the performance of, of the PTO and the, the, the performance of a project. So that, that's the link that we want to see. And I think um, the, the, the information in the, gu in the guidance documents gives you the basis by which to, you can make that comparison. Okay, that's fine. The, the next question from Michael <coughs> is about the PCS website. So if you can bear with us, Michael, 
we'll answer that at the end. Um, stick with us and we'll get to it. If I could just move on to Patrick's question. There's a little quote from Patrick here, so if I just read this word for word, the inherent challenge for the wave energy sector is to convert the high force provided by low-velocity waves into the high-velocity movement required to generate electricity. But the question, uh, Limerick Wave's PTO solution is to generate electricity with high force and low velocity. Would that solution be considered? Is that a question that you can answer just now, or is there maybe some guidance that you could give to Patrick in relation to that? I think on specific kind of technologies, I'm not sure we could we could probably um, address that very specifically. Um, but more generally speaking, um, you know, I think, uh, and I, I hope the the guidance document's clear enough that. Um, you know, there's a number of requirements um, that, uh, and duties that a PTO has to has to, has to endure and has to be successful at. Um, and at, at this stage, you know, uh, we're very open to understanding the different approaches and ideas that people do have. Uh, what, what will be important, I guess, is that um, you know the applications that we do have have to have a clear narrative of how they are going to going to operate, going to kind of achieve the target outcomes, going to achieve the LCOE. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think the emphasis is back on the applicants to, to prove that it, their idea is something that's different. It's a step change and um, we'd be more than, more than happy and willing to, to, to get those, those, those kinds of uh, those ideas through and into the programme. Okay. Paul has picked up on the, the licensing issue and, and his question is, can you manufacture and sell the PTO to all rather than license it? Uh, I, I think that uh, manufacturing and selling the, the PTO would be what we would like to see uh, in the first instance, but the requirement to, to license it still remains. Okay. Um, and this is, this is part of the, of the, the the methodology that we have used, and Rona has talk, uh, talked about uh, pre-commercial procurement, um, it's a state aid compliant methodology for us to, uh, to, to provide 100% financial support to projects. But that comes with a requirement to share as part of the, the EU regulations, if you like. So we, we have a requirement to share knowledge through the licensing of IP. So it's not something that we can pick and choose, mm -hmm. uh, um, and we have chosen to take that methodology in the end. The, the advantage for everyone is that funding levels are much higher. Um, f for some, perhaps, the disadvantage is that they have to license the IP. Okay. But, but, it, uh, but that, that, that there, is, there isn't an option between uh, manufacturing and se selling or and or licensing. The licensing requirement remains. Right. That's part and parcel of the, the of funding, the overall, essentially. Yes. Right. Okay. Um, Jamie has asked uh, about stage three, where you're looking for a one-tenth scale model. Would that apply to the development of PTO components? And he's mentioned specifically, you know, hydraulic machines to drive the generator. So does it apply to the components? Um, I think uh, inevitably, you know, if you're developing a tenth scale machine, then clearly you have to source components that would would, would, would fit to that kind of ultimate, you know, ultimate scaling. So um, I, I think it really depends on the type of design, of course, and the, the type of solution that, that, that Jamie's, you know, particularly thinking through. Okay. Um, I guess if those are kind of off the shelf components at that stage, then um, that's, that's an easier potential solution if they have to be, um, you know, bespoke mm -hmm. um, for that particular scale. Then I guess we would be questioning. Jamie would be questioning is the, the, the kind of cost trade-off of that, and can a, can a, an, another alternative scale be, be be explored that that does achieve the uh, at that stage the, the you know the performance and the kind of costing and the real, and, and the, the performance metrics. Um, so uh, you know within the the, the, the confines of the the, the the tenth scale that's envisaged within that stage three. Um, I, th I think it's you know it's, a, it's perhaps a judgment around um, what's what's the most appropriate um, uh, approach right. to take, and, and it may be that different circumstances apply. It seems on the face of it that you need to have a part that would fit in the model, but there might yeah. be specific sure. specific issues. I, th there. I think I think yeah I think what's important is that the um, the, the, the performance metrics and the, the target outcomes that we've talked about are able to be just demonstrated you know, at, at that stage. That's really what we're looking for, so uh, a confidence that the, mm. 
the, the, those key metrics can be can be addressed. Okay. Um, we've got a question here from Benjamin. Uh, how will WES assess important niche markets which are commercially vi viable at different LCO targets? And again, he's given an, exa an example of remote power for aquaculture uh, or ONG remote power applications, e.g. Yeah, for you know, desalination. So. Uh, yes, we're, we're aware that obviously costs will be different for those different markets. And if you make clear in your application what your, what your market is and what your target is, and you have information about the, the, you know, the, the potential cost of energy for that particular niche, rather than the 150 kilowatt, uh, sorry, pounds per megawatt hour, um, then that's fine. You, you, but you need to put that narrative within your application and demonstrate your pathway to, to achieving those uh, forms figures. Okay. So just make it clear in your application. The niche market element. Yep. Okay. Um, fairly straightforward question this time. Uh, can an Israeli company participate in the programme? Not as it stands. You would have to be um, a company with a, a registered within the European Union, the European Economic Area, okay. to apply for the um, the call. So it's not just Europe; it's the European Economic Area. Okay. So there is a boundary there. There is a boundary. People. Yes, absolutely. That, that's fine. Uh, from Marcus, for stages three and four, certification was mentioned. Uh, do you need to provide certification from a body such as DNV or GL, or is it acceptable to provide evidence from self-testing uh, to show what level the technology has achieved? We would prefer to see some sort of independent verification rather than self-testing. So I'm not going to say that it needs to be DNV. There are other uh, agencies that can provide verification but it would need to be independent. Right, okay, and that goes back to what yeah. we were talking about earlier on as well, doesn't yeah. it? Uh, Steve has asked, it's a good question in terms of a collaborative project. Um, if there's a collaborative project with multiple partners, would it be expected for them to form a legal entity or would a formal collaboration be sufficient? Question. Uh, I, I would have to clarify that. Right, so that's one that we will have to check PCS, on. But uh, my thought is that, so, that um, somebody has to be the applicant. Mm. Okay. Um, so there would probably have to be a lead lead partner within the consortium, if you like, right. to make the application. But I will I will check that. Okay. That. And if, if you could submit that to PCS, we can give you a, a detailed answer for that. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I think the you know the, the coming back to IP. I mean, the, I guess the terms are would be common, there's no particular special treatment or otherwise mm. for particular collaborations or, or individuals. So um, I, think, I guess under that circumstance, mm. we'd have to, you know, people would be treated with a, under a level playing field. But I think yeah, you know, to get the specific answer, it's probably a PCS. Uh, yep. Okay. Um, yeah. So you heard that there, Steve. Make sure you get that question <laughs> into PCS. PCS. We'll talk about that in a second or two to make sure you get a definitive answer to it. Um, I think time for one more before we, we wrap up. Uh, and Paul has asked, is there a benchmark metric uh, available on efficiency, cost of PTO system, etc., a technology performance level to align with stage gates? Do you want me to read that one again? Because it was quite complicated. <laughs> uh, I'm how happily a bench is there a benchmark metric uh, available on efficiency, costs of PTO system, etc., a technology performance level to align with stage gates. So uh, I, I guess under our assessment process, we'll be looking at the kind of evidence base that people put together, um, and uh, this is about the I guess the narrative and the. I mean, the, the, the applicant's own evidence base. Um, they have undertaken sufficient, you know, um, testing, I guess, to, um, to, to prove that, that they're at, their technology is at a particular um, part of its development cycle. Um, you know, and a part of, I guess, the certification aspects that we've just touched on will, will be helpful in providing, you know, that, that evidence base. Um, I mean, I, I think what we would say is that um, we've tried not to be too definitive on, on that at this stage yeah. because it, it is a new area. It's a, it's a, it's a good, big, um, challenging kind of objective that we have set ourselves. Um, so I, I guess what I would say in, in that approach, we've, we've taken, um, you know, uh, I guess a more uh, open view around um, listening to people's narratives and, mm. and their perspectives on what 
that appropriate development in a, f a path to, should look like. Um, but but just to, to be to be to be sure, there will be a, of course, a technical assessment of all of these applic applications, and that is something that people will be looking at um, as to whether that's a, a, a credible and uh, a confident. Um, you know, pitch that people, that applicants are making. Okay, that's great. I, mean, I, think, I think we've been keen not, not, not to put you know, a definitive benchmark in terms mm. of you know, it must be that this efficient, it must be this reliable, because um, w that might preclude technologies that we, we want to have included. And at the end of the day, it's the cost of energy that's important. So you can achieve that in different ways. You can have a less efficient system that's, mm. that's, that's cheaper. Mm. So you, know, you, you can't just look at individual performance metrics for a PTO and say, you know, you must get above these, these figures, otherwise we'll throw you out. That's, that's not the, the right approach, and that might preclude a number of technologies. Right. So I think the focus on levelised cost of energy in the longer term is, is the target that we're aiming for, rather than a particular efficiency or reliability. Right. So it's the end goal it's the end that product. We're, yeah. we're, we're looking yeah. at. Okay, well, so. we've run out of time, unfortunately. There are a few questions that we didn't get round to answering, but we did say that we would finish today at quarter past ten, and we're conscious that people may have other things in their diary that you need to rush off to. So what we don't want to do is carry on, and then you miss out on those answers. Just to wrap up, though, if I can just emphasise to you, um, if you want to take your interest in this PTO, PTO call further, first thing you need to do if you're not already registered on Public Contract Scotland is make sure that you're registered on there. And the second thing is once you are registered, make sure you register your interest for this particular call. Um, you'll find a website address below the video window that we are sitting in at the moment that will take you through to the Wave Energy Scotland website uh, and you can access a lot of information from there and there's also a link directly through to the call on, on PCS on, on that page. In terms of the questions that we didn't manage to answer today, if I could just ask you to submit those via PCS if you want a, a, a full answer to that, and the team at WES will make sure that you do indeed get a response to that. So submit your questions via PCS, you'll get an answer that way. That will, of course, uh, be open for everybody else to see as well. And indeed, if any of the questions that you did ask, um, if the answers perhaps prompted a supplementary question, again, please do go into PCS and submit your questions there. In terms of the deadline for applications for this particular call, it's, uh, and I'm going to read this to make sure I get it absolutely right, it's 12 o'clock, that's British summer time, uh, on Friday, May the 22nd. So that's 12 o'clock, Friday, May the 22nd, uh, this year. Uh, you need to make sure that these are submitted via PCS hard copies won't be accepted, so you must make sure that your applications go through the PCS system, which of course relies on you having registered and expressed an interest in the first place. So it's a reasonably logical set of processes to go through there. Um, the other thing to mention, and I hope you don't think I'm being op overly patronising here, it's a bit like when my wife says, have you read the instructions? One of the bits of guidance I was to pass on to you was make sure that you do actually read all of the guidance documents. They're there to help, they're not a barrier to you being able to successfully complete an application. The whole purpose of them is to make sure that you're absolutely clear about what's required. So make sure you read the guidance. Thanks for joining us today and good luck with your applications. And if anything isn't clear, just to remind you again, can't emphasise it enough, get those questions in via PCS. Thanks for joining us.